and welcome to hello and welcome to the final state library uh, chat of the year my name is astrid edwards and i am your host for today although this is an event for the state library of victoria i am on holiday in sydney at the moment and i would like to acknowledge the gadigal people of the kulin nations on whose land i grew up on and who i am visiting now i would like to pay my respects to elders past present and emerging and I would like to note that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today, we are joined by Trent Dalton. Trent, welcome. Astrid, hello everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me, Astrid. It's so great to be here. Um, you know, you're the best book uh, chat interviewer in Australia. So I just think I could not think of a better thing to kind of round out my year than a chat with you and the amazing um, you know, members of the State Library of Victoria and all those people who support that amazing library. So big, big hello to you guys. That is lovely praise, Trent. Thank you <laughs> very much. Um, now you are joining us from Brisbane, aren't you? Brisbane, um, we've just been in a sort of deluge of, of rain and uh, but we've just got some sunshine right now outside these blinds. Um, I'm coming at you from my bedroom where I've been banished by my wife and kids and uh, and they're out there just um, having a ball on school holidays. Christmas is almost here. It's just the best time of the year, Astrid. And, you know, after this kind of crazy year, it's just been, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying summer. Uh, look, I'm coming, coming to you from my dad's bedroom in Sydney. And this has been a bit of a shocker of a year, but the one thing I really love is that, I wouldn't be able to interview you for the State Library of Victoria if we hadn't all been accustomed to using Zoom and other kind of virtual forums. Yeah. So it is the yeah. one silver lining that I can find uh, at the moment. And, now, then, and, and then also be able to get out to audience members that you would never have been able to get to. That has been massive. Hey, like I've, I've been getting messages from people in like mining communities and stuff that we're on a normal literary book tour, you probably wouldn't normally get to. And so it's been pretty cool. Hey, it's been, yeah, you're right. There's been silver linings. Absolutely. Yeah. Not many, but some. Now, <laughs> not many. Yeah. For those listening today, you can ask Trent Dalton uh, a question yourself. I can fill out the time asking Trent questions, but if you have something specific, uh, please type it into the Slido form that you are, um, uh, the, the platform you're watching. And the hashtag is afternoon tea and talk. So hashtag afternoon tea and talk. And that way you can ask Trent questions directly. Now I imagine Trent that most people who are watching us today have read Boy Swallows Universe, which of course was your debut novel published in 2018. And many have either read or are planning to read over the holidays, your yeah, second yeah. novel, oh. All Our Shimmering Skies that came out a few months ago in September, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. So you don't need any, you are so well known and loved by the reading community and the literary community in Australia. But just as a reminder for everybody, you are also a journalist. You have been a journalist for 20 or so years. You are a highly awarded journalist, two Walkley Awards, plus a bunch of other honours. And I think that uh, that was a very casual introduction, but it is a reminder that you are an excellent storyteller across platforms, whether it's the Aww. you know short form written word or magazine or online or in a Aww. very Astrid, long novel. Thank you. Thank you. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to know that I am that. Yeah, if I am, if I am indeed. You are that. I get to say that you are that. But to kick <laughs> us off, because yeah. many people uh, won't have had time yet to read All Our Shimmering Skies, mm. can you introduce us to your latest novel and in particular, uh, the protagonist, Molly Hook. Oh, thank you, Astrid. Uh, Molly Hook is a 12-year-old girl living in Darwin um, at the start of the bombing of Darwin, World War II, February 19. Um, the poor girl, Astrid, is living such a tough life um, with her father and her uncle being raised by her father and her uncle. Her mum has gone missing. Her mum has disappeared in the most tragic of circumstances. Um, the poor girl has come to believe that she's cursed. And um, as the bombs drop over Darwin, she's even come to believe that maybe the bombs that are falling across that beautiful city that we all know and love so well, um, that she might even be the reason that they're dropping. And um, in order to change her fate, she decides as the bombs are falling to um, go on an all or nothing quest into that deep, deep country, that magical wilderness that we also all know and love um, on that, in that top end up there. 
and um, in order to find the man um, who she believes might be able to um, kind of remove her curse, this kind of family curse that's been brought about because of the actions and the greed of her late grandfather. Now, um, along the way, um, four gifts fall from the sky um, to aid in her quest. The first gift is a map. The second gift is a friend. The third gift is uh, is a miracle. And the fourth gift is the end. And uh, that's a little mantra I told myself when I was writing this book. And um, and that's the sort of story of all our shimmering skies. And along the way, she's aided by two of the most incredible characters and two of the people I love most in the book. A cantankerous actress named Greta Mays. Um, who's on the journey for her own reasons and and needs to find her own answers and a world war ii japanese fighter pilot named yukio miki who literally falls from the sky and um and Mo molly and greta would be right in thinking that this guy could potentially be um the enemy and a member of you know the the japanese imperial navy um but what if that guy turns out to be the best friend they've both ever had and um and that's the sort of story of all our shimmering skies and it's my absolute love letter to this beautiful country of ours it's my love letter to to the dna of storytelling that runs through my blood um and and it's my love letter to my two daughters beth and sylvie so it's um yeah it's many things and i'm so honored you know that it's kind of out there and it's so cool to be talking to you about it astrid because it's sort of nice when a book is kind of in the world you know you sort of give birth to these things and then now it's sort of it's actually got some legs now and it's been re it's really cool to be talking to you in december as opposed to september where it's kind of i know what that thing is now you know i know what it is and because the wonderful readers and some of the people who might be listening to this let me know what it is and that's really powerful yeah so you've actually just foreshadowed my kind of first substantial question oh cool i, I did get to speak to <laughs> I you i love foreshadowing i love foreshadowing I did get to speak to you uh, right as the book came out and very few people had read it and you didn't quite know because you couldn't how, you know, many, many readers would respond. We are a few months on and I'm really interested in what readers have told you and if there is anything that you've come to understand about the book by readers giving you that kind of, you know, insight or feedback or emotional response. Oh, Pete, I, I tell you the, 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 recurring thing is um is weeping which is beautiful like actually by the end just as boy swallows universe is it's it's a tough book um at the first half it asks so much of a reader and and i've been urging them everyone who reads it just there's this really powerful thing about about a gift it's a gift that a reader can do for a writer which is get through the darkness and find the light you know, and, and, and I tell you the thing that readers are telling me most is just thank you for bringing that light again. And, and that reminder that, that there is always hope and no matter how many obstacles you might have in front of yourself and boy, didn't we have bloody obstacles this year, you know, and I just love that this book came out kind of in the back end of, of a hellish year. And, and it was so beautiful to get messages from people of Victoria, you know, who were still right in the thick of lockdown when that book came out and, and just going, thank you for just taking me out of myself and and giving me an escape into a land that I might not get to for a fair while. And that's been really powerful. And then people telling me that they are um, they're reading it for the same reasons I was writing it. Like I was I was kind of trying to pay tribute, right? I tell you the truth, Astrid. I was trying to pay tribute to those Australian kids um, of about 12, 13, 14 who are out there right now going through their own kind of battles in their own little bedrooms in on the fringes of our cities and and they're looking to books um as their avenues of escape and uh and you know i did that when i was a kid like that was really important for me to have those avenues and uh escape into the works of tolkien or you know um edgar rice burroughs or and you know those those people who uh you know those yeah, amazing storytellers who could who could take you away and literally help you escape from whatever situation you're in and that's been a powerful thing and but then it's been just people receiving these things people people worried for me about about the darkness that's in me but people so appreciative of, of the light that comes at the same time and then just people reading the most incredible kind of um 
comparisons into it. You know, I've got a letter from a woman who I love, you know, a massive essay about how it compares note for note to Wizard of Oz and not even realizing that it, it did. And she's like, oh, well, Molly's um, Dorothy and, and, and Bert the Shovel is Toto and, you know, just all these amazing kind of things. And, and uh, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West is Aubrey Hook. And, you know, I just love that stuff. So we're into that phase now where people can really start to analyze the text and then, and then a kind of um, also seeing all the hidden kind of tributes I'm making to Homer and to uh, Shakespeare and to just all of those people who I loved as a kid. And, you know, so it's, um, it's all these different sort of things, but also, but ultimately it's, it's that same thing that I got back from Boyce Waller's universe, which is really beautiful people writing to me about their own darkness, you know, and that doesn't have to be COVID. I mean, just, it might be like marriage troubles and it might be, having difficulty with a son or a daughter or someone battling addiction. And these people send you these really deep messages about how Molly's story, this girl from 1942, um, World War II, is reminding them of their own power and, and resilience and, um, and the love that they can find in places um, that in unexpected places. And all of those things are very, very powerful to me. And it only comes from, it can only come like you're terrified when these things go out, right? That you're terrified when they go out into the world, but all of that good stuff can only come by being vulnerable and by letting go of a book and putting something out there. And, and, you know, I feel sick when these things, things go out into the world, you know, I really do like physically ill, like, and I just can't sleep and stuff, but now it's just beautiful because it's out there and people can, can take it and have it kind of, bring something to their lives. And yeah, it's been amazing, Astrid. It's been really beautiful, some of the responses. I love to hear you articulate um, how readers have been, many, many readers have been responding to you. I have a bit of a, I guess, a philosophical question. Um, mm. You know, and I, maybe it's a chicken and an egg thing. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes authors um, think that when they've published a book, um, they've said all that they want to say and they don't care what readers think. <laughs> They've made their point. And sometimes other authors um, get really offended by how different readers interpret their text and they kind of say, no, 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 that's, you know, not what I intended, etc. So kind of referring to either one of your books, you know, your first book or your second, mm. Boys Follows Universe or All Ash and Ring Skies, you know, who owns your story or the interpretation of the story, I guess, is my, my question. Oh, that's beautiful. What a great question. I, I you know, hence like, and, and this is why I feel ill about it. I want people. I want people to love Molly Hook and Greta Mays and Yukio Miki as much as I care care about them. And I and I've realised now, and all of my anxiety. See, I finished that book, and I did have that initial like apps. Like I got like I was crying when I wrote it. Not to sound like a douchebag, Astrid, but I I kind of the the last kind of final scenes of that book, I was genuinely kind of crying, and like the, some of the things that happen and the things that unfold in a deep way, I was like, oh man, I love these characters and I love this so much. And then by the end, I hit the full stop and the final full stop. And I go, I'm really proud of that. Like, I'm, I'm just proud of that. And that feels really good. And, you know, I have this thing, you can't listen to this thing, the brain, you know, you cannot, um, you cannot be um, a slave to the brain because the brain will betray you at every, at every turn. Um, but if you're not going to listen to that, you have to listen to something. And so you've got to listen to the truth of your spine sometimes and the truth of your heart, which, and the spine, when I'm, what I mean by that is something that never lies and, and that, you know, when you get a chill down your spine and it's, it's a, it's happening for a reason, you know what I mean? You are absolutely feeling something. And, and I got that chill down my spine and uh, several moments at the back end of that. And I go, well, that's good enough for me, you know? And, and then, but that can only last so long and you can, you've got to be, that's a sort of a selfish kind of thing because you go, well, what am I doing it for? Because then here's the gift, right? Then all these readers, right? They're going to go in. They are going to park the car in some, some shopping center. They're going to go down to some little town and walk all the way to some little bookstore. And they're going to talk to that amazing bookseller. And they're going to go, oh, you should read this thing. This Dalton guy's got done another one. And they're going to fork out, I don't know, 20 bucks, 25 bucks even, you know? for that thing. And then they're going to go home and they've got finite time and, you know, they might be putting the kids to bed and doing dinner or a bloody doing work, coming home on the bus. And they're spending that time with my thoughts. And already it's such an egotistical business, this novel writing thing, because even in the doing of that, you're sitting down for months on end, assuming 
that the world is going to be interested in these thoughts that you're writing across 430 pages. So that's a massive sort of exercise in faith in yourself. But also you need to have such faith in the reader that they're going to even pick that thing up. And then they do. They give you that kindness, that generous act, that a miraculous act. And so I just don't want them wasting their time. You know, I don't want them thinking, oh man, Trent, I gave you all this time and, and you gave me that ending or, you know what I mean? So I just have this, I mean, I've felt that all through my journalism. You know, it's like people go down the news agent. Saturday morning, you know, they sit down with a Trent Dalton yarn that goes for 4,000 words, man, I, I want them to feel something by the end and be rewarded for their, for their, their time and their input. And so I have this app. I mean, I have this always this absolute loyalty to the reader and, and ultimately it's them, you know, that's the power. And uh, because they're the ones that you get the rewards from. So then, so then, so whose book is it? It's totally theirs. And, and it's like, it, it's theirs the minute I send it to the publisher, I think, Astrid. Like, it's like, it's mine for a bit when I just hit that full stop and I have that little moment to myself and that needs to be enough, you know. Anything from there, it's like, okay, it's yours now, take it, you know, and, and I can't be precious about it and because the rewards are so great. And so, like, Boy Swallows Universe, you know, people are so terrified about people reading about this kind of wild 1980s past of mine, right? I'm, and um, I'm going like, oh, man, you know, what will people think about people that I love who were like heroin dealers and stuff. And, and, uh, but here's the reward you're at some event and someone comes up and goes, Oh man, thank you so much for writing that because that's my mum you wrote about. And, and that was my brother and that was my father. And then you get a letter Astrid. I got letters from people saying, um, I have not spoken to my father in 20 years and I read Boy Swallows Universe and I gave him a phone call. And, you know, I mean, that's just like, I got chill. I get chill. The spine doesn't lie. I'm getting chills now because of that person who did that. So that book story belongs to them and, and it means so much to them. And, and that's what I love about the whole transaction anyway, is that they're picturing people in their heads and they're picturing certain people um, grimaces on Aubrey Hook's face. They're seeing it their own way. So it does belong to them. And, they're the one who's, who's put the time in. Hence why you get so um, cautious about any of these like adaptations that happen to it. And so many people have come up to me and go, you better be, you know, you better do those books right. You know, if anything is going to happen to them, you know, don't, don't spoil those things. Cause it's, it's kind of sacred in their heads. You know, that's sacred stuff. You know, that what you conjure in your mind is precious. And so, yeah, I, it's, I think it's theirs. I think it's theirs and they do, you know, all stories, just like I feel, like I feel a little bit like the return of the King is a little bit mine because I gave so much to Frodo, you know, whatever, you know, whatever's mine. You know what I mean? If, if I don't know, you know, the corrections is a little bit mine because I felt so deeply about it, but it's, I know it's his, I know it's the guy who wrote it, but I love being a part of it. And that's why I say, I write on these messages on anyone who buys like all our shimmering skies. It's like, thank you for sharing my skies. It's like this thing I've been writing. It's like, you're, you're sharing it now where, where this is, we're together on this, you know, this is your part of that story and, and the story evolves through them. Sorry, rambling answer Astrid, but it was a cool, cool question. So typical of the best book interviewer in Australia. Oh, so thank yeah. you. Um, Trent, I love it when you ramble, which is why I don't interrupt. Okay, good, so good, good. So, but, then, yeah. but I have to say that's one of the best answers to that type of question I've ever got. And I want to tell you that I was one of those, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids who my mum had to bribe my friends to come over and make me leave the house because I felt that the world of books, including Lord of the Rings was just better. And forever, I will be grateful for all uh, authors um, who let me into the worlds that they have spent all of their time creating. Well, Astrid, I know about, you know, I know about you and I just, and who you are and what you do. And I just think it's beautiful that, that you, flip that back too and you sort of you're giving all these other people access through this sort of stuff to to that thing i think that's a very powerful driving force so th hence hence the great bloody matrix of it all anyway is that it all feeds itself and we're just this one big storytelling matrix and it's so cool yeah I, but i love that young astrid just you know getting lost in her world you know it's, that's priceless that's sacred yeah young astrid wouldn't leave the house but i have a confidence <laughs> that young astrid um uh has been thinking about, well, I've been thinking about it for, for years. I didn't like reading Australian literature when I was that teenager because oh, yeah. I thought it was boring. Now I was obviously young and hadn't experienced a lot, but I held that view well into my thirties. 
Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. It's changed that view. I love and adore Australian literature and Australian writers. Yeah. But I felt locked out of it because everything felt like a stockman and a sheep or red yeah. desert. Um, and I just, I just didn't care, to be honest. Yeah, um, yeah. There are some beautiful Australian contemporary writers and I think the last decade has changed everything. And I think that you are one of those many oh, contemporary writers. Oh, wow. Wow. And you, I want to ask, um, both in Boy Swallows Universe and in All Our Shimmering Skies, you are able to create and evoke a very particular sense of place and time. So, you know, Brisbane in the 1980s and mm. then Darwin in the 1940s in World War II. And these are different. They feel like a snapshot in time. I feel like I'm in Brisbane. Oh, in the wow. That's Brian beautiful. Running from the bombs in Darwin in 1942. How do you do that? Um, oh, that's really beautiful, Astra, that you say that. Um, yeah, I'm, if anyone's read my book, Boy Swallows Universe, that stuff that I talk about in that about the details and, and taking a moment and expanding it through your ability to slow life down and look at, every, at the finite and the microscopic. Um, and uh, um, and it's, it's, um, it's really a powerful thing. And it comes from that journalism thing where you're layering the details so much that you can't help but be there. And you're writing with all the five senses. Like I, I literally have a piece of paper st stuck on this HP computer and it says five, five cents it, like three words, five cents it, as in, write this with all five senses. So, so put the reader there on the smells and the touch and the, but, but, and everything of that, all senses, because that might help you get to that elusive sixth sense, which is the thing that I have inside me that makes me love my kids that I can't tell you why and the depth of that. And it's a, it's not a spooky sixth sense. It's, it's the thing that makes us miss our families during COVID and these really important sort of sixth sense that we have, which, which, um, which gives us love, the whole concept of love and soul and all that really beautiful stuff. Um, I'm trying to access that. And so putting all that detail in there to do that. And then, um, but that's all, that's all. There's a lot of stuff in Boy Swallows Universe about how Slim Halliday, who was this kind of wild figure in my past, you know, he talked about that. And that's how he got through prison for like 30 years by remembering to slow life down and, and um, slow it down in the sunshine hours and make the dark hours go quick. And, and um, you know, I, I genuinely do, like I genuinely live my life like that. I'm not just, that's just not some writer bullshit. Like it's like, I walk out the door and I tell my kids like, man, go pick that rhinoceros beetle up gently and, but just sort of get closer to it. And, and, you know, Yukio Miki in all our shimmering skies, he's this sort of Japanese fighter pilot who feels like he's on borrowed time, but I made him do exactly what I try and do in my own bloody backyard, like stop for a bit and just stare at the intricacy of of the way a spider has built its web you know or 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 listen to the way a bird is sounding and i've got these cockatoos just outside our door and it's like just watch them for a bit and you know all that stuff you know but being in well enthusiasm is so i've got i'm enthusiastic about the words i write like i'm enthusiastic about talking to you astrid i'm enthusiastic about putting the reader there enthusiasm is such a massive thing in my life and so it's all that it's like i'm so enthusiastic about the story that i want to put that reader there and i probably overdo it sometimes i know i do you know you just it's like all right trent move on move on let's get back to the narrative and the plot and but um yeah i mean so interesting what you say though about i felt the same way about oz literature you know for a while like i'd and i'd go to these like I go, oh, I want to go to some South American writer. I want to go to um, America or, or Britain and, you know, capture these sort of novels and soak them up because I've read enough, you know, I love Ruth Park, like Poor Man's Orange and um, Harp in the South and stuff reminded me of my family. And then I didn't realize though that I could, I could actually write stories where I, I show some of that world that I loved in Poor Man's Orange. Like I read Poor Man's Orange and I was just like, oh man, that's my dad or that's these, these are people that, but then the reason I love Steinbeck um, is that he's writing about, about people that I knew in my version of that in, in Brackenridge and Bribey Island in Brisbane and Dara, you know, that he writes about in Cannery Row or uh, um, Grapes of Wrath. It's like, I have those people as well and realizing I can incorporate my versions of that. And the same way I love Dickens is he's writing for the same reasons I'm trying to write. I know I hate to be so highfalutin that I dare link myself to that amazing man but i'm trying to link it in the way that he just felt a great compassion for the people that were around him that he saw and I th i'm starting to think yeah man i can just 
I can do the same. And I just have, I have a, I have a great connection and feeling for people who are on the fringes of our cities. And um, I've written 20 years of journalism about those people because I'm just writing about myself, you know, and I'm ultimately, I'm ultimately just writing for this 12 year old boy, which is Trent Dalton, you know, who's kind of, um, who's in those worlds as well. And so whilst I'm writing about 1942, um, World War II and all our shimmering skies, I am secretly just between you and I, Astrid, and your amazing listeners and watchers. Um, I'm writing about myself in early 1990s Brackenridge again, you know, because I've just can't, I, I don't know why things happened the way they did. And, um, and, and I will hopefully never answer that and I'll continue writing books in order to find those answers. But um, yeah. So in, in answer to all of that, it's like, if you can do that in an entertaining way and not make these books boring for young Trent Dalton, who's a version of that, who's out there in the suburbs now, like that's who I'm, I'm writing for some kid who's, who's picking my stuff up maybe and going, Hey man, help me escape. Well, okay, I'm going to help that kid escape and I'm, and I'm going to give him all forms of the narrative and just make it go places. And, you know, that stuff's important to me, actually, like not being boring, you know, and, and finding that balance between hopefully writing half decently and, uh, but also just giving a rollicking yarn, you know, just a cracking yarn. And I felt sometimes the books I'd read when I was sort of growing up were guilty, Australian wise, guilty of forgetting of just bloody entertaining the reader i just don't think that's a crime you know i don't think there's something so terrible about that and i so feel that so many people yeah we're doing that we're just we're blowing people away with these narratives but also with this beautiful writing as well and yeah so but yeah man it's it's so great i i love that you feel that that i'm you know i mean i'm honored that you think i'm in that world of non-boring kind of writers so you are definitely a non-boring writer <laughs> and, uh, uh in the hugely beautiful and entertaining, um, you know, spurt of Australian literature over the last 10 years. Um, I like the idea that someone, maybe you, is the Dickens of our generation that is <laughs> around the world in like 200 years. I, I, oh, I, wow. Imagine, I, imagine, imagine. Now, I have a question about, you mentioned adaptation before and mm. how readers sometimes talk to you about not stuffing mm. it up. Um, <laughs> Ford Swallow's universe is becoming a movie, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, beyond even bigger, it's uh, yeah. Well, it's like an eight part. They're looking at an eight part long form series. Yeah, they're oh, that's expanding. That's so than a movie. It's gonna be wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, what is your role in that? And I guess as a creative, like, how much kind of do you control the script? Do you like, like, mm. how much of you is going to be in this new version on a different platform? Oh, it's really cool. Like, and and there is no. There's no way in the world, right, that this idiot, this knucklehead from Brackenridge ever thought, this is what they're calling me, Astrid. I'm executive producer. And I'm like, wow, wow. And I'm like, what does that even mean? And uh, But it's sort of essentially, it's like, I'm, I'm on don't make it shit detail. And it's like, it's just, let's keep this thing pretty authentic. And and don't make all those readers who invested it, don't piss them off, you know? And so it's, um, oh man, I'm so proud of this thing. I've, I've read... I've read sort of about three and a half of the written episodes so far. And Astrid, um, there is a tone, um, there is a, a universe at play in this piece, in this series that we've never seen before. And um, the screenwriter is this amazing guy, John Colley, who wrote Master and Commander for my favorite Australian director, Peter Weir. And, um, you know, there is just some, like, you know, Edgerton, Joel Edgerton is all over it. Um, it has got... You know, and it's like, I mean, serious deal sort of people like this place called Anonymous Content, who's making it through Edgerton and this other place, Chapter One and Hopscotch here in Australia. So it's like Britain, Australia, America and Anonymous Content did like The Revenant and like massive things. And uh, and uh, and so it's like ridiculous for me to sort of think, but it's just got quality, you know, and 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 it's it's a it's a it's Caitlin. Oh, you know, we can do things in this that so. So, for example, you know, my mum in my mum, my actual mum read that book and she's a key figure in that book, like an inspiration in that book. And she reads it though. And she goes, Oh, Trent, you know, it's so sweet what you did for me. You painted me as such an angel in that book. But you know, you know, the truth Trent, is that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't dumb about this stuff. I was right there in the thick of it. And I knew every decision that was being made in that world. And uh, so we can, we can use that, you know, we can put that in an eight episode thing, things that I just, you know, 
is 10% of what actually happened in, is in Boy Swallows Unit. Like there are things, Astrid, that my mum went through and survived that it would blow people's minds, you know, if I, if I ever had the opportunity to go there. And, uh, but we kind of can incorporate some, just some extra stuff and expand that world in an eight part series. So it's really exciting. Yeah. So my role is just, I'm executive producer, but I'm kind of just going, here's some other things. So I go to the screener. So John calls me and he goes, oh, mate, know this moment you wrote in the book where did that come from and I'll and I'll tell him the full story and then he'll go oh man I didn't know that that's even more emotional than what was in the book and so we can incorporate that and it's just this amazing creative process Astrid and it's been the most joyous thing to even and this is the funniest thing ever when when like the producer and John came up to my neck of the woods up here in Brisbane and they're going around to places you got to understand like Dara and Brackenridge which are just kind of fringe suburbs of Brisbane but you know they're pretty sometimes bleak they're beautiful places with beautiful human beings but just classic working class and uh, and they're doing the they're doing the filming thing going oh this is this is amazing and it was just surreal and i took this sort of boy swallows universe tour of of brisbane for john and and troy lum the producer from hopscotch and uh and they were, their minds were blown you know because some of the like bogger road prison slim halliday's prison cell is still there like you can literally go and whack a camera in front of that and go there you go like it's it's amazing you know so it's so such an honor, you know, that, that one day there's a kid who's going to be living out at Brackenridge or, or the equivalent of like a place like Logan housing commission or whatever that exists today. They're going to see a story like that and go, man, that's my story. And uh, I'm really proud of that. I can't wait to, to have that moment, you know? Uh, it, um, it gives me chills. The idea <laughs> that um, not only uh, are you and others writing such beautiful stories, but they're making it to the silver screen and, and yeah. moving all the rest of it it's just oh, uh, makes me very happy we are almost out of time Trent. Yeah, great great yep one, one quick question oh cool okay yeah bonus question yeah bonus question it has been a very long year and i think many people uh watching us here today are looking forward to sitting down with a good good book i think they should all have all our shimmering skies but what <laughs> book are you going to be sitting down with Oh, I, I, well, I've got two on the go right now. Um, Mayflies by Andrew O'Hagan. Uh, you've probably, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's so up my alley. Um, two guys in 1980s Britain, um, massive Joy Division fans, massive Smith fans. Um, it's like, it's like all your favorite Smith's re records come to life inside a novel. Um, and then I hate to be on a music theme, but um, there's an extraordinary Beatles um, biography um, and it, by his name's Craig Brown. He just won a massive bio biography award over in the UK and it's called one, two, three, four. And it's the story of the Beatles, but it's told in the most remarkable way where it's just a series of vignettes that all come together to form the miracle that was the Beatles. And, uh, and, but it's stories like, for example, um, the postman who, who had to deliver mail to Paul McCartney's house. Um, and he was the man that, that 20 years ago um, ran over John Lennon's mum. And it's like, how does that guy fit into the world? And, 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 and it's stories about Jimmy Nickel, like the guy who filled in um, uh, for Ringo Starr when the Beatles toured Australia. And how did his life go south after that moment? It's, it's classic, great journalism set to the backdrop of the greatest band that ever existed. So it's, that's been my really fun. It's a, it's a doorstopper, but it's been a really great, you know, those you know, summer books where you just sort of, so you can take a break from Mayflies or something. Then I'll just pick that sucker up and just, Oh, I'll start here. And, you know, just, I love balancing that. I do that a lot with a bit of sort of like a really good intense book. And then almost just a book that I can just do for just popcorn, you know, and it's just. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do that, Trent. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you for those recommendations and thank you for joining us today. May you have a wonderful holiday period. Uh, this is the last afternoon tea and talk with the State Library for this year. The series will be back next year, so stay tuned. I want to thank everybody who uh, tuned in this year. Everything is still available on the State Library of Victoria's website and enjoy the season. <laughs>